it is such a solo, lonely type of career. Episode 5. Feeling like we're settling in now, the early jitters are subsiding, and we got a podcast. But you can do the best logo in the world, but if nobody sees it, it doesn't have any impact. Welcome back to Art Design Music, where we talk to visual artists that create iconic work for the music industry. I'm graphic designer and illustrator Judd Haynes, and I'm going to do my best to be your host once again. Not sure if you've subscribed to the podcast yet, but please do if you're liking what you're hearing and want to make sure you don't miss any episodes. We're on Facebook and Instagram as well at Art Design Music Podcast. On the first four episodes, we had conversations with a graphic designer, an illustrator slash music video animator, a screen print poster artist, and a legendary music photographer. We've covered a lot of ground already, and today is no different. This episode is for all the fans of hand lettering. You know who you are. It's a special craft in the design and illustration fields, not for the faint at heart. If you have the patience to hand draw every line and every curve, letter after letter, to shape perfect and beautiful typography, then you're a special kind of strange. Luckily around here, we love strange. Oh, and this episode is obviously for music lovers too, of course. If so if you're a fan of ACDC, Bob Dylan, Blue Oyster Cult, Willie Nelson, Boston, or any other iconic bands of that era, then this is also for you. If you've ever binged an HBO show, and who hasn't, read a copy of People Magazine, or Time, or Us, or Illustrator, then this episode is for you. I don't want to spoil it, but let's just say that designer and artist Gerard Huerta has been on a run making incredible work for decades. He indulges me as I grill him on his logo work for ACDC, HBO, and so many more. If you're sitting at home with your computer or tablet handy, you're welcome to pop over to our website and follow along with the show notes. I've gone through and found visual examples of almost every single thing Gerard and I talk about to help illustrate the story. Head to www.artdesignmusic.com. Click on episodes where you'll find the link to episode five, Gerard Huerta. Anyway, so let's get to it. I reached Gerard at his studio in Southport, Connecticut, where he let me skip all the formalities and dive right into a discussion on one of my favorite logo projects from his portfolio. This one just happens to have appeared on more than 200 million albums sold. Welcome. How are you? Thank you. I'm doing fine, Judd. Awesome. Thanks so much for being on here today. Well, thank you. My pleasure. I wanted to start with the logo you made for ACDC. Are you cool to talk about that? Sure. How old were you when you worked on that? I was I was 25 years old, um, and so was the group, actually. You know, they were kind of my contemporaries. I did work on their first album, first release in the United States called High Voltage, and did a, a piece of lettering for that. So would that have been the year before or a couple years before? I believe it was 1976 was the High Voltage album. When you made it, you weren't meaning to make a logo. You were just making a uh, typeface that worked with the with the album cover. Yes, it was. Um, it actually harkened back to a piece I had done for Blue Oyster Cult when I was at CBS, um, which was also a sort of religious <laughs> oriented piece, uh, which was called "On Your Feet or On Your Your Knees," and it, it featured a church on the on the front with a limousine. ACDC, Let There Be Rock, of course, is from Let There Be Light, and we have the cloud over the, you know, and the light coming down over the band. So um, the reference really was Gutenberg Bible lettering, which was uh, essentially the first type, uh, movable type book. Um, so that's where that influence came from. I remember watching the Graphic Means documentary uh, that came out a few years ago, all about kind of uh, how graphic design and printmaking was done before computers which you were in. My career was about half analog and half digital. All that stuff we used to do, we did by hand with ink and, and airbrush and gouache and overlay film and acrylics and T-squares and pencils and markers. And so because it was a different way of doing things, it really required uh, what I think was a lot more skill. The computer has kind of allowed... Uh, for a little more of a democratic uh, design world because of the software. And one of the things I like to point out is when you do a piece of lettering, um, there are really three components, a good drawing, smooth edges, and equal strokes. Well, the equal strokes you get from a computer very easily. 
and the smooth edges you get also very easily. But the drawing is really the key component for me and still is. I still have an entire drawing set up here that gets used first. Everything gets drawn and then gets scanned into the computer. And in Illustrator, everything is plotted out and, and colored and, and finished. When I look at a lot of your work, I'm always blown away at how the old stuff is so smooth, so crisp, and it looks like it could have been created in Illustrator today. When you look really closely, of course, like that Blue Oyster Cult logo you mentioned, uh, you see all the textures and the painterly features in it that uh, it would be very difficult to replicate in Illustrator. So I wondered uh, kind of how it is that you created work that was so crisp and so clean back in those days before any of that technology existed. I think it's just, you know, just tightness. You know, you just spend a lot of time on it. In fact, recently I have digitized that Blue Oyster Cult logo in Illustrator. And if you were to look at my Facebook Gerard Where to Design page, you'll see it as the header. It looks exactly the same, just cleaner, <laughs> just a lot cleaner. Oh, uh, because awesome. I had to pull, uh, since I didn't have the art anymore, I, I actually pulled that uh, that logo, the old logo, out of the album cover, which of course is printed smaller and there's texture and dots and all kinds of stuff. And um, there wasn't a whole lot of cleaning up I could do on it. When you were working on logos like those two, which I, I sorry to say, I keep using the word logos, even though I know that That's okay. neither of them were meant to be logos at the time. They just became logos. Right. How large, like scale wise, would you be working um, usually twice up, so 200% of what it was going to uh, be reproduced. And also, it depended, it depended on sort of the quality of the logo. I mean, something like ACDC could be done quite small because it's all straight lines. It's, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's no challenge to that, really. Some other more complicated ones, which have a lot of curves or scripts or things like that, generally it would be at 200%. So you would draw it by pencil first and then ink it, and then the colors and the shades that were in there, how were those added? It depends on the logo. For example, Blue Oyster Cult w was actually done in airbrush. So we, we, I would trace down the pencil tissue, would cut frisket or cut acetate, and then you would airbrush to get that effect. The ACDC was actually done with a process of tracing down the pencil sketch, inking the very outline of it, and then with color overlay film, it's cut. It's all cut with uh, an X-Acto knife and a straight edge and uh, colored that way. And then I think, I believe I added color pencil to just sort of shade a little bit of, of the bevels. So those are two separate techniques. And then a lot of logos, for instance, something like Ted Nugent is just a, an inking on vellum. It, you do a very tight tissue, put your vellum over it, and then you carefully ink it and clean it up and and um, photostat it to size. When I was in school, I was the last class taught the original paste up. Oh, really? <laughs> we didn't touch a computer the whole time. Never used Photoshop Illustrator, you know, InDesign, Quark, none of it. And then when I went out in my work term, it was all computers. They did no paste up. And really? so I was so out of my element. Oh, isn't that funny? Well, the advantage you have, though, is you think differently about images or imagery. I know I do. Um, and because I still work the same way in terms of drawing and even coloring things. So I think there's, I think there's a lot of, of carryover and a lot of benefits to having learned things traditionally. And, and, a, and a lot of it is you just see things differently and you see things better. You know, I remember when I was at Art Center, everybody had to take lettering and it was really the most hated class Everybody hated it. I, I happened to love it. I just It just came naturally to me. But people weren't taught to letter to be able to craft a word. They were taught lettering to, to learn how to see, how to see negative spaces and, and see even strokes and see smooth curves and see all those things. So those sort of benefits carry into the computer world. Um, I cannot sit in front of the computer and draw you something. You know, I, I have no reference point to be able to do that, even though I have an eight and a half by 11 page in Illustrator to work on. I have to draw something and scan it in to be able to to make that work for me. But that's because I see everything in terms of a drawing. I don't see it in terms of a blank page and, and a mouse. Jumping back real quick to the uh, the graphic means documentary, you mentioned the Gutenberg Press and 
the first Bible. They block out a good piece of that movie to talking about this because it was such a huge part of what we do now. I mean, they use that press for, I think, like 400 years or something like that. Mm -hmm. So what I want to know with the ACDC logo, you liked that font choice for that cover because it had kind of a bit of a churchy style. And I know the music video for the song, Let There Be Rock, is very churchy. Did they have the music video already or did, did you kind of like? Um, as far as I know, the, um, the album cover art was done before the video. I don't know that for sure. I mean, that was all pre-MTV, if, if I mm -hmm. recall. So um, I don't think I would have had any access to it. Yeah, I wonder where that video even would have appeared back then. I have no, <laughs> I have no idea. Well, they've constructed videos for the Beatles and, you know, a lot of other groups, I think, taking, you know, taking old footage and, and, and creating things. So, And I saw on, on your Instagram page that you still have the original Trace Down sketch from creating this ACDC piece. I have the, the original Trace Down sketch and I have the artwork, the, um, the original uh, board with, with inking and color overlay film. Amazing. I can only assume over the years that you've been offered people to buy that from you over and over and over again i'm surprised you you still have it um you, you'd be surprised at very few i mean there there have been a few people that have offered but um i might sell it in a minute if i could get enough money for it but <laughs> nobody's... i can see the like the, the rock and roll hall of fame or somebody wanting to have that for sure well they, they probably would want it donated but <laughs> i don't know <laughs> But I do, I have saved, a, I have saved all my finished tissues. I have a very um, soft spot in my heart for, for the drawings because they're sort of like the blueprint, you know, it's, it's not the finished artwork. And, you know, we see finished artwork and it's it, in a funny way, unless you're an artist, you, it's kind of unrelatable, but everyone can look at a pencil tissue and see the markings on it and guidelines and compass points and things. And realize, gee, this is really drawn by hand. This really exists, mm -hmm. you know, as a sort of starting point for where it went. So I've, I've kept all those. And, and um, I, I actually thought a, mo a more interesting book that I could do instead of a book of uh, artwork is do a book of tight pencil tissues on vellum. And the book can just be a sort of transparent, translucent uh, pages of pencil sketches. Oh, that'd be amazing. So the paper itself would be vellum? Yeah, it would just be printed on vellum so that it looked like the tissue. It looked just like what yeah. the final tissue looks like. Oh, yeah. And as you're looking at one page, you can kind of see a little bit of the page behind it. Through yes. It. Mm -hmm. Oh, that would be beautiful. I feel like there could be a book out there about the logos, the word marks of rock bands. If you look at so many of them, they look like they're inspired essentially by your ACDC and Blue Oyster Club. <laughs> Metallica, Anthrax, Iron Maiden, you know, Testament, Overkill. Like I made a list here of logos that I look at them and I'm like, yeah, they look like, essentially they looked at your ACDC logo and just kind of like went with that. Well, the one that I like the best, uh, which is a sort of homage to me is Spinal Tap. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, because that, you know, that's sort of a, um, well, we got to, you know, we're, we're a rock band. We got to have a rock band logo. And then that's what they have. <laughs> Yeah, and I've seen the ACDC logo used, uh, like, kind of spoofs of it and knockoffs used in every other kind of industry. You know, there's restaurants out there that have the restaurant name done in that style. Here in St. John's, there's a company that just does, like, dump runs. Like, mm -hmm. they have big trucks, and they'll come by and take whatever whatever it is you've got that you want to get rid of, and they'll get rid of it for you. Their name is just four initials, so they, they yeah. basically their own version of your logo. And their slogan is, uh, Dirty Deeds Done Right Cheap. <laughs> <laughs> there's so many and be because i i did it i do i do sort of get these things emailed to me and you know little kids wearing t-shirts with adhd and a b c d my my grandson has a hat that says a b c d <laughs> and and again it's it's interesting because the it's not really the look to me the logo design it's it's the fact that they've used it all these years it's the exposure you can do the best logo in the world, but if nobody sees it, it doesn't have any impact. The big one that some people always refer to is the Nike Swoosh. And, you know, they'll say, well, I want something like the Nike Swoosh. Well, the thing about the Nike Swoosh is not so much the design as it is how much they've exposed it to the point of not even having the word Nike associated with it. It's just the symbol. So 
it shows you that the, the two components are the design and the exposure of the logo. Nike's been messing with my brain, though, because the last few years they've been making basketball sneakers with the, with the swish in the opposite direction. Oh. <laughs> well, now, is it, is it so that if you make a footprint, it, it's the correct way? No, it's not. It's not printed on the bottom of the sole. Oh, it's, it's on the not. Side, okay. It's on the side of the shoe, but I it's see. really large. Like the swish is almost the whole side of the shoe. Okay, I see. So I've been watching an intense amount of basketball, and that Nike logo on the side of the shoes just screws with my brain the whole time. That's funny. <laughs> with your logo, um, the ACDC one, obviously, at the time when you were making it, as you said, they were kind of your peers as far as the same age. You worked on their first record that was released in North America, and then this would have been their second release. He had no idea at that time that they were going to go on to become one of the biggest bands in the world. When you look back at that logo, is there anything you would have done differently now? Um, I don't think so. I, um, I sort of finish the job and move on to the next one and don't think too much about, about it. In fact, I had not even thought about those letters because it was it, at the time, it was just a job. You do your best job, and then you move on to the next job. And I remember about, I think it was about 20 years ago, I was going through the drawers here. And my office mate was standing next to me, and I'm kind of shuffling through prints. And he goes, wait, stop. And he goes, you did that? And he's pointing to the ACDC logo. And I said, yeah, I did that a long time ago. And he goes, why isn't it in your portfolio? What's wrong with you? Don't you know how big that is? And, and he started going off on me. And I, and, I, and, I, you know, and I got me to thinking, you know, I don't really think much about the history part of what I do because it's just to get more work. You know, that's why you do um, certain things. So you try to present a portfolio with a lot of things because, you know, it's the old story if the art director wants you know, so an illustration of a hamburger, I got to see a hamburger that you did. You know, it's that, it's that sort of thing. I mean, more so now than it was in, in the early days, because I think in the early days, particularly in the record business, there were much more creative, creative directors and creative art directors. To look back on it now is, it was just really a, a great place to be. Of course, a lot of it's luck and, you know, a little bit of hard work. Um, Again, it was just meant to be typed for that particular record. Right. I know the, the record that they did after it, they used a different type. Yeah, it's kind of funny how it, it just sort of worked its way back. I assume there's never been, they've never come back and been like, hey, here's a pile more money because we ended up making that our logo for the last No, that's, that, that's never happened. Um, you know, it, the, the work that I did for CBS, um, things like Ted Nugent and, oh, I don't know, Blue Oyster Cult and a few others, I was on staff, so I had no ownership in it anyway. It, it's, mm. it, didn't, it didn't belong, technically belong to me. And I don't even know if I have permission to show it, but I show it anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's my work. Um, and, I, and the other thing is it's sort of promoting them anyway. So, you know, in the case of the way things were there with freelancers, you know, you negotiate a fee, you do the job, and you go on to the next one. And I, I doubt if anyone could predict that you'd be seeing these on cassettes and CDs and, you know, Apple Music and Spotify. And I mean, you know, who, who knew this stuff would even last? I mean, it's, it's, it's very strange how we have this culture that has embraced this stuff and, and still, you know, still enjoys it and listens to it. I honestly could not leave my house and either go in the car or go for a walk and not encounter this logo somewhere <laughs> i love it i mean i'm 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 a fan of the band and mm -hmm. i and a huge fan of that logo and so I, I don't mind but it's just it's one of those things where it's like i think it is just part of the overall pop culture everywhere now so i have one last question with this one and then we'll move okay. on all right can you just talk for one split second about what the difference is in the d in the acdc logo um the diff well the, well the d is is a different letter form because it has uh, a horizontal top and bottom, whereas the A and the C are pointed. The the traditional lettering, uh, if you if you took lettering and understood lettering as the forms, you would see that those points, because they're points, would go below the baseline and then above the at, at the x height would go above where the d is and that's a, that's visual uh your because what your eye is going to do is make that d look bigger because you have this large horizontal at the top and bottom but only these points so in the drawing of it 
Um, see, this is where the I, the I comes into play when you have letter forms. If you look at something and you measure it, but it looks wrong, then it's wrong. You change it because it's the, the I is the ultimate thing that um, defines what it is that you're doing. And that, that logo has been redrawn many times and redrawn correctly by some people and redrawn badly by other people who decide that the points and the top of the D go to the same, you know, go to the same line. Um, so what, what happens? The D looks like it's a lot bigger than the rest of the word. So I don't know if that answers what you're talking about. That's, a, that's exactly what I'm okay. talking about. Okay. When you were describing that and the fact that essentially the D is slightly shorter than the other letters because of the points, I went and went immediately went to Google and checked it out. <laughs> and it blew my mind because all the versions that have been redrawn where all the letters are the same height, the C's look smaller, especially yeah. the last C. It looks almost ridiculous. Yeah. And I've never seen that before. I've never noticed it. And now I cannot unsee it. Every, every time <laughs> I've seen the logo since then, every time I look, I can immediately know whether it's your version or it's been some kind of like redrawn right. kind of version over the years. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Well, you can imagine how tortured I am when I see it. But, but you know, <laughs> one, thing you can, one thing that you can do, and this is where the drawings are telling, you can go to Instagram. It might not be big enough, but you can go maybe to the Facebook page. And look at the original tracing, the original drawing, and you will see how those points extend above and below and how there, there are two, essentially two lines. There's a line where the A and the C go up to, and then there's the line where the horizontal uh, of the D um, exists. And you can see it's purposely drawn that way. It's, it's, it's the way um, you make it look like they're the, the, all the same size. So I'll switch gears here now and, uh, and, and let you get away from okay. this, uh, this, this amazing legacy logo. Sopranos, Six Feet Under, Game of Thrones, Deadwood, Westworld, The Newsroom, Sex in the City, Entourage, True Blood, Oz, Flight of the Concords, True Detective, Succession, Big Little Lies, Girls, Veep, Boardwalk Empire, Insecure, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Silicon Valley, Band of Brothers, and The Wire. This is just a tiny sampling of the amazing award-winning shows loved by millions all around the world that all started with this same clip. <laughs> Another amazing kind of iconic piece that you created the logo for. Um, it was interesting because when I did that, which was back in the 70s, they, the HBO was, it had been purchased by um, Time Life, I believe. And it was a, just a small cable channel on cable vision and they had a logo that existed that was somewhat similar except that the b overlapped the o um it it just really overlapped the o it looked it, like they were trying to make this funny letter i don't know what what it was and i was basically called in to refashion it or redesign it so that uh, it was consistent and then they, you know, again, with exposure, they've just used it all these years. And, um, and of course, the, the um, station got bigger and bigger. And, and, you know, you just kind of ride that wave. I've seen that first one you mentioned, and it is very 70s looking. Yeah, it just, it just looks like it's, it's unfinished, I guess. I mean, I've, I've actually worked on a few things like that. For example, um, the People magazine, you know, People Weekly at the time, it was called that was done in the 80s, and People Magazine came out in the 70s. And the original logo, you could tell if you took a magazine and put your T-square on the logo, you would see that the letters bounce, which says to me that the original logo was done with press type because it's a way that they could overlap letters and, and do things. And then somebody drew a scotch rule around that. So... That was another one of those things where we have this logo, but there's problems with it. Can you rework it, redesign it? So what we did is we, instead of having a scotch rule, we simplified it, made a heavy roll around the outside, and then made sure all the letters didn't bounce around, um, but maintain kind of the same general look because they, they did use the logo kind of large on, on the cover. I think it's even larger now. But a lot of times you get these kind of assignments where, you know, can you fix this? Can you redo this? You know, another another pro, uh, project was the Nabisco logo. That was done by a group, Bernhard Fudima Design, 
who happened to be good friends of mine. And they had they had reworked the the Visco logo to be softer, and then it was my job to um, redraw it and 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 you know make everything line up and work well and and weight correctly and and all that. So um, so a lot of those projects sometimes are things that exist but need a facelift. Yeah, I've been hired on a few occasions to do exactly that to take a brand that has just over time has become outdated or isn't performing properly. And it's just kind of like, can you take it and figure out what's wrong with it and just fix those things mm-hmm. as opposed to starting over? Mm-hmm. So for the record here, your not a logo turned into a logo, ACDC, has been printed on the front of over 200 million albums. <laughs> 200 million. I mean, that's insane. And then consider how many t-shirts and posters and all that kind of stuff. And then this HBO logo, which for me, HBO kind of came to Canada later than in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us, it was kind of late 90s. It was around the beginning of Sopranos and Six Feet Under is kind of when the Canadian uh, network started kind of bringing HBO to Canada. So for me, I knew HBO existed, but had never seen or heard that little brong sound (laughs) thing. And so every, every, when the new Sopranos episode came on, it started with that. And that was such a big deal to me. And I just love now that, I mean, they have this massive list of shows that are kind of like groundbreaking all over the world and they all start with that sound yeah your logo well that sound i i believe it's a c chord but it's a c chord with the third missing meaning there's there's no uh there's no e for a major third or an e flat for a minor third so it has a very distinct sound it doesn't tell you if it's happy or sad it's just that middle middle road anyway that's a little aside you're obviously a musician yourself yes sort of self-taught i mean i never took lessons or anything have you played in bands over the years oh yeah yeah i played it i played in bands uh you know since eighth grade you know we're all through college i played with my brother-in-law who's a kind of a famous guitar tech in southern california and uh, we had a band in fact it, it kind of paid for my college because we worked three nights a week when I moved to New York, I stopped and I didn't, I didn't start playing again until my son was in the school plays and then I started playing in the pit. Uh, and then we started a band, an acoustic band actually in about 2004 um, and we're still going. That's been, that's been a lot of fun. Well, it's, that is one thing that's been a little sad about this pandemic is all our gigs got canceled. <laughs> yeah. Has it affected your work much? Because I know for me, almost my entire client base is music industry related. So I saw my entire year evaporate in about a 24 to 48 hour period. Oh, no. Yeah, it's it's slowed down. I mean, I'm getting little jobs trickling in, but no, no, it definitely is affected. I mean, people aren't working. I mean, it's just one of those mm-hmm. things. I had posted on Facebook that the number one uh, non-essential worker was the artist. <laughs> so, one of the things that I did, and this is just to keep working. If if you know when, when I'm slow here, I have been digitizing a lot of those old jobs, like Time Magazine and People Magazine, as, as I mentioned, Blue Oyster Cult and Boston. And it's been nice to have the time to do those things because I would never normally do them. I, they just wouldn't uh, wouldn't get done yeah and it's nice having it all archived somewhere so that you know if you ever do decide to do something with it you've got that piece of work it's there already done. yeah and for people listening i mean you made reference there to uh magazine masshead designs that you've done over the years this has also been a big part of kind of your body of work you designed the time magazine masshead you say it mentioned earlier you worked on people uh us pc magazine ad week uh, and one of my favorite ones uh, was the Illustration magazine. I have a whole bunch of those here. Oh, do you? Yeah, it's it's a great magazine. It was just sort of meant to resemble an old time artist's signature, you know, just kind of a hand done sort of you know sort of thing. Yeah, I love it. Would you approach those kind of working on those mass heads for magazines different than you would for working on music, or is it really kind of very very similar thought process? Um. Well, it's funny because you had mentioned, well, we've been talking about the ACDC logo, which is, of course, a, a record job. Um, within three months of that logo, I was working on another four-letter word, Time Magazine. I was working on Time that same year, 77, um, mm-hmm. and you know, produced a whole series of comps of which they landed on, on the one that, that you see. But um, you design for the job. You design for the client. 
you try to understand the problem and you design what is appropriate for that job. One of the things that was said to me one time, when you looked at my portfolio, this person said, it looked like a different person did every one of these pieces. We've Mm -hmm. looked at other portfolios and there's a style to them. People work in a certain way. We looked at your portfolio and the same guy who did X did Y and there's no connection whatsoever to the look of them. And I thought about that and and I think it goes back to what I just said about designing designing for that particular pur- purpose or that particular client. Um, you solve the problem. You don't design something to get your style out there. For me, it's been just sort of an expansive career in terms of the different things, you know, starting out with music, then going to magazine illustration, going to magazine mastheads, you know, eventually Swiss Army doing watch dials where I'm drawing numbers and hands and tick marks and calendar wheels and all that stuff. So it's been interesting because the common thread really are are letters and numbers, but the jobs have been, you know, been different in the context of um, what they represent. And and I've it really enjoyed that. It's it's made me still enjoy my career, enjoy working. I, I still am happiest when I have a job here that I'm working on. Sorry about that. It could be fun if you take it. No, it says potential spam. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that could be even more fun to take. Well they call every day. I know who it is. And I just don't I just don't answer it. A minute ago, you referenced uh, the Swiss Army watches. So tell me about that. Yeah, it 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 started out with there were a little company in Connecticut called the Forstner Group, which was essentially the importers for the Swiss Army knife in Switzerland, a company called Victorinox there. And what they did is they had a sales force, and they would go out and, and you know and sell these knives. And A gentleman, Myron Pollenberg, who I worked with at CBS, he worked in the advertising department. He used to hire me to do lettering jobs. He was working with Swiss Army um, or Fortuner Group with packaging. And they came upon this thing where they found out that nobody was using the word Swiss Army for any kind of marketing purposes. So they trademarked the name and they started kicking around the idea of what is Swiss? What do people think about when they think of Switzerland and, you know, chocolate, this, that? And they hit upon the watches. And so they were talking and decided maybe they should get a watch designer. And Myron said, why don't you let me take a stab at it? I really would like to do that. So Myron sat down and started drawing up this watch that related very much to the knife in, in terms of the look of it. He hired me to, to draw the dial. Uh, very sort of utilitarian, clean, you know, numbers, very legible so we, you know, I did this watch dial and they produced the watch and it just became a huge success. It just, just unbelievable success. So they started doing other watches, wanted other watches in the pipeline, like a officer's watch, which is stainless steel and a chronograph and a military style and all. And, and so Myron was designing these watches and I was sitting here in my studio inking up all, this was pre-computer inking up all these uh, dials at 10 to 1. It was just a real kind of interesting craft-related uh, sort of job. I mean, all those all those numbers are hand-drawn. All those ticks are hand-drawn and, and yeah. calendar wheels, if you can imagine dividing a circle into 31 pieces and doing that. I mean, it, it was real interesting uh, for me. And a second ago, you mentioned uh, CBS. So you worked at CBS before you went out as CBS Records, I should say, uh, before you were freelancing, but you started freelancing very young. So how old were you when you were at CBS? Um, I started at CBS when I was 22. Um, I was right out of art school. I couldn't get a job. I moved to New York with my wife. I couldn't get a job. New York was going broke. It was a terrible time to be in the city. And I saw all the people I wanted to see. Nobody was working. They said, oh, we'd hire you in a minute, and da-da-da. But, you know, look, our designers are wandering around with their hands in their pocket. Hmm. Um, so, But I did get some freelance work. So I decided, well, I'm going to freelance. And, and I started freelancing a little bit. And then I decided, well, if I'm going to freelance, I need a card. So I did this kind of oversized card with my name on it. And I went back to all the people I'd shown my portfolio to, and I got two job offers in one day. 
So um, I took the job at CBS because it was the it was the title was album cover designer. And I, I mean, for me, there could have been a better job that a 22 year old kid could get. So I took the job and I was at CBS for a year and four months. So I was just at the end of 23 years old when I started freelancing. Wow. And freelance the whole time ever since. Yes. And so when you were at CBS, is that when you worked with like doing type for like the Bob Dylan record or Willie Nelson, Cher, Chicago? Yes. Um, well, it's Cher was later. Um, the ones that I did at CBS were Ted Nugent, Blue Oyster Cult. Um, I did do a Willie Nelson one, but I think that was, I think I was freelance when I did that. Um, Cher was definitely on a freelance basis. Uh, Boston was also, I had, uh, it was right after I went freelancing. Um, I'm trying to think of ones you might know when I was at CBS. Um, the, the reason I left CBS is I had started getting freelance work from other people. And I would work well into the night and then go to work feeling really tired. And, and, and eventually I thought, you know, if I could just have these daytime hours, you know, I could, I could live normally and, and, you know, still make decent money. And, and, and I knew CBS would continue to use me. I had a very good relationship with all the art directors and creative directors there. So, um, and that did happen. I went freelance and I got some great jobs like illegal stills and Chicago 14, the thumbprint and, you know, a lot of other stuff, all those things I did on a freelance basis later. That's amazing. The Chicago one, what were you using to draw that? When I look at it, it looks almost like it's just like marker or pen or something. Um, it was actually done with a rapidograph pen or rapidograph style pen. I use Mars, Statler Mars. But what we did, we, we had a guy in the mechanical department, this guy, Jim Wong, who had these great big thumbs and he, we did a whole bunch of thumbprints of his and statted them up and then took what was very indicative of the thumbprint, which is that funny swirl that comes up and, and then the outside. And then I took the logo, which was designed by Nick Fasciano um, years before and, and you know, worked it in there. Um, and basically just rapidograph pen, just sitting there and just kind of roughly, you know, making these, these strokes to look like it was a thumbprint. It is a cover that I've been aware of for a long time and always come in a fan of. Yeah, well, that was that whole Chicago concept of John Berg's was great because it, it it's very simple. So you've used the logo, but we put the logo in a different sort of form, like leather tooling or embroidery or a chocolate bar or a thumbprint. You also mentioned a second ago the debut Boston record, which uh, is also listed in the top 15 like best-selling albums of all time. And you did the typo typography on that one as well, right? Yes. Um, the art director on that was Paula Scheer, and she, who's at Pentagram now. And she was an art director at CBS after I left. She called Roger Heisen and myself in. Roger Heisen is an airbrush illustrator. He's not working digitally. But we shared an office for 25 years, and we were classmates at Art Center. So we did a lot of collaborations with airbrush and lettering like Clint e Eastwood, Bronco Billy, and the 1990, 94 Super Bowl poster. But anyway, we got called in and they came up with this concept. I think, I think Roger and Paula came up with this concept of this sort of giant, massive guitar and the, you know, biggest guitar in the universe kind of thing. And then my job was to put some lettering on it, to design some lettering. So I designed this kind of quirky lettering and had to draw it as if it's wrapped uh, around the guitar and, um, you know, did the trace down tissue and traced it down. And then Roger uh, illustrated it. I'm a big fan of Paula's as well. She's actually going to be on an episode of this uh, podcast. Oh, good. Good. Tell her hello. <laughs> I, I will. I will. And um, uh, she's another one like yourself that kind of when, when I got a response, I was a little bit blown away and kind of like, I was like, Hey, maybe I'm onto something here. If, uh, if folks at this, this level are willing to chat. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I'll give you some just some some background on that. I've thought about this a lot because I'm an artist and a guitar player. Those are both things that you learn to do by yourself. You're alone. You you know you don't. It's not something that you you do with other people necessarily. Being a freelancer, um, you spend a lot of time not talking to people. You know, everything's done by email. Nobody wants to talk on the phone. So 
when you when you do get some sort of engagement, social engagement, sometimes you'd be surprised how often an artist will say, "Oh, yeah, that sounds fun," you know, because you're not doing anything but just doing your work and not talking to anyone. So, um, I think there's that element with artists, um, definitely, because it it is such a solo, lonely type of career. Yeah, there was one person I reached out to who uh, lives in Chicago, and I'm a big fan of, and he. Uh, uh, his kind of agent wrote me back and said, well, he doesn't do press. And I was like, well, this isn't really press. This is a couple nerds talking about art. <laughs> and then she, she kind of laughed and was like, uh, let me take that to him and see what he says. <laughs> she's like, she's like, you know what? He might be into that. <laughs> well, again, as you said, I mean, we're just talking about, you know, what we do daily and, and, you know, you have a shared experience because of what you do. Uh, so it allows for a little bit deeper discussion than if I'm being interviewed by a newspaper, for example. I want to play you something here now, and then we'll, we'll talk about another set of your uh, projects. Weekends are a good time to escape to the woods. <laughs> Unless the weekend begins with Friday the 13th. Because these are Jason's Woods. And nobody leaves them alive. Friday, the 13th, part three. <laughs> that clip kills me every time. <laughs> I, I really, really miss the old days when they had like that deep voice. Right. Like narrator in the trailers. They don't do that anymore. And I really miss it. <laughs> so you made the poster for this as well. I design. I'm trying to think. I can't even picture it except for that funky lettering and the, a knife or blood or something. I, I mean, yeah, I did. I did. I did the logo. I don't know about the rest. I can't even remember what it, the poster looks like. I tried finding out whether there was a separate credit for the illustration uh, as, and the lettering, and I couldn't find anything. Well, let me uh, let me see if I can find uh, the one sheet. For folks listening, I'll just describe the poster. is a It's an image of Jason kind of behind like a shower curtain or a just like a, a, a regular curtain, like a sheer curtain, and he's kind of poking a knife out because this was the first big 3D horror. I only did the uh, the title, the the dimensional lettering. Well, that's a pretty exciting one. And then another movie poster I saw that you did is Star Trek Three: In Search of Spock. Yes, that that was actually a real interesting project. The idea was to turn his face into what I call sort of a logo, you know, kind of graphically depict his face sort of uh, uh, embossed or, you know, in, from the background with these two spaceships sort of, they ended up putting these spaceships, photographs of these spaceships in there. I didn't have anything to do with that. Uh, but my job was to, you know, design the, the sort of space and his face co coming out of it. Um, but I remember that being a fun, fun project because there, were, there was no lettering in it. I didn't design any lettering. I was designing a face. And that was also like Leonard Nimoy's first directorial, mm -hmm. so a really big deal for him as well. What can you tell me about the series of illustrations you made for the National Guitar Museum? In 2008, the um, mortgage crisis hit. And... 2009, I started losing clients because they were being let go. You know, my contact at Pepsi was let, let go. Um, so anyway, what I'm getting at, it, it became a very slow time for me. It, you know, the jobs were not coming in. I, was, I wasn't turning down any work. Let's put it that way. And so what happened, I would still come into work every morning, and, and I would want to continue to keep using Illustrator because – you know, I, it seems like if you take a two-week vacation and go back to Illustrator, you forget how to do something, um, you know, anyway. So I had always wanted to do this idea of vintage guitars, uh, very much as if they were brand new. Uh, I remember being a, a kid and going to Beach Music Center in Huntington Beach, California, and looking at the guitars. And the difference between then and now is the guitars then had signs that said, do not touch. So you just got to look at them and they were all shiny and beautiful and, 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 and great. So I thought, well, you know what? I have some vintage guitars. Maybe I'll illustrate, you know, I'll draw one and do it up. So I, I started on a, a Gibson ES-335 that I own. You know, I just started working on it, getting lost in it and, and sized it to be actual size and then had it printed out. And I thought, wow, this is really kind of cool. You hang this on the wall and it looks like you know, you got a guitar hanging in the wall framed. 
so I just started doing them in, in my off time. And eventually I ended up with about 21 or 22 of these. Um, Harvey Newquist, who started the National Guitar Museum, um, which originally was a Facebook page is all. And he hired me to design a logo for him. He saw him and he said, how would you like to put those in our show? It would be really fun to have these. And I said, great, let's, you know, let's do it. So we printed up about eight of them and framed them in their full size, their actual size when they hang on the wall. They've been touring with the uh, National Guitar Museum exhibit. And do you sell prints of them? I have not. I have not done anything like that. Um, I, I think eventually I would like to, but the, again, the problem is how do you how do you do it? Do you do it the way I've done it, where you're using a um, you know a ten color Epson printer so they look spectacular, or do you do them offset and then they're just sort of an ordinary you know poster? I haven't seemed to come to terms with how I want to present them. Uh, I mean, I'd love to do like a limited edition of a hundred and, and sign them and and, and, yeah, no, yeah. and notate what the what the actual guitar is. If you wanted a portrait of your guitar, and I have I have the existing one, I could I could put the dings and dents and all that stuff in it for you, and it'll be your guitar. But I haven't. Yeah, and I guess if they're made in Illustrator, switching the color would be easy. easy exactly. Enough. So I have, but I haven't. I don't know. So it's it's, it's not, it, this this is this is like the book. It's just all up in my head, and nowhere else. <laughs> So you said the museum started as a Facebook page. Is there a brick and mortar museum that people can go to? Um, it's traveling. If you, uh, you, the, you can go to the National Guitar Museum website and he has two shows running. He has one called Medieval to Metal. And then he has the normal show, which is much bigger. The Medieval to Metal is the one that I'm in. And it's more for gallery type spaces. The uh, main show, which is a whole bunch of guitars and amps and all this stuff. There's even a 45 foot flying V um, that somebody in Texas put together. Um, that's for bigger, um, bigger spaces. So, um, so it moves around every, I think about every three months, he's got two of them going. I don't know what's happening now with this pandemic. I doubt if, if anything is moving, but. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to come on again. I find, like, say, your body of work and just your whole career so far has just been kind of mind blowing, and uh, you know everything from the, all the music work to the movie posters to you know the mass heads and even the the watches, and it just it just keeps going and going. It's really kind of inspiring how you've been able to work in so many different directions. It kind of seems like anything that you've touched has uh, kind of turned to gold. For well, thank you, thank you, Judd. I. You know, sometimes I look at the work and I think, you know, there, there's there's so many things out there that are so good that I didn't do. You know, there's a lot of good work out there. Well, if it's a heavy metal logo, it's probably ripping you off. So. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I could have kept Gerard on for another two hours. And even then, we would have only scraped the surface of his incredible career. If you want to learn more about his work, for Willie Nelson, Calvin Klein, Cher, The Breeders' Cup, Super Bowl, Apple Music, Pepsi, Ted Nugent, and on and on and on, his website is www.gerardwerta.com, which is www.gerardhuerta.com. And he's also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. His is an incredible legacy, and I'm so happy he took some time out of his day to chat about art and design for music with me. Not long after we recorded this chat, I was working on a logo rebrand for a Toronto music venue that has been open for 35 years and wanted to freshen things up. I applied what I learned from Gerard. Remember that part where he talked about making the D and the ACDC logo a little bit smaller to properly balance the weight of the letter forms? Well, I gave it a shot. It totally worked. Holy hell, the logo is so much better. Thanks, Gerard. Got a question you'd like to ask Gerard? We're turning the mic over to our listeners for episode 11. So if you'd like to ask Gerard or any of our other guests a question, just send it along to artdesignmusicpodcast at gmail.com and you might get your answer on air. We'd love to hear your actual voice. So send an audio question if you can. Otherwise, apply your typing skills and we'll love that too, of course. And how's this for fun? Everyone who sends in a question or comment will be entered in a draw for an amazing reprint of the original Japanese version of Gerard's Friday the 13th Part 3 poster. Because these 
are Jason's woods. It shows off his typography loud and proud, and I'm sure will look amazing on your walls. If you're following the podcast Instagram and or Facebook, then lucky you, you're already entered in the draw for the poster. You follow us at Art Design Music Podcast. If you enjoyed today's chat, you might also want to check out episode seven with Paula Shear. Remember Gerard mentioned that she was the art director of the Boston album? Well, her story is incredible, and that Boston cover is just a tiny, tiny piece of the impact she's had on the music industry. You'll see what I mean when you hear it. We've got t-shirts, pins, toques, and stickers on our website for anyone that would like to contribute to the financial distress created by spending all my time making a podcast when I probably should be working on billable projects. Pop over to artdesignmusic.com, click on that merch button, and get yourself a fun shirt. I want to thank my super longtime buddy, Lil Campbell, for playing his heart out on all the drum beats in this episode. Way back in the day, I played in a band called Winter Sleep with Lil, and we were opening for a great Canadian band called The Constantines for a series of shows. Their drummer, Doug, was a massive ACDC fan and would play their tunes backstage, in the van, at the hotel, basically everywhere that he could. I never understood the fascination with the band before that, but on this tour, I finally had my aha moment and figured out what all the excitement was about. It just clicked one day, and then I was an instant fan. I guess you could say Lowell was there for my ACDC birth. He still plays in that awesome band, Winter Sleep, who I actually got to see play only a couple days ago. You should check them out at wintersleep.com. And lastly, before we sign off, let me tell you about what's coming up next. I thought it'd be fun to complete an art and design circle. On this episode, we met Gerard, who designed ACDC's earliest records and logo. How fun would it be to track down their current graphic designer and find out what it's like working for the world's biggest selling rock band 40 plus years later? Michelle Holm is an award-winning graphic designer from Jersey, whose clients include none other than Bruce Springsteen, Beyonce, Shakira, Sia, plus tons and tons more, including the aforementioned ACDC. She has a knack for taking album art to new and exciting places, and I know you're going to enjoy my conversation with her as much as I did. See you next on episode six of Art Design Music. Bye!